Okay, I guess I'll get started if that's okay with everybody. Oh, and I just want to uh, let everybody know that this is being recorded. If there's any objection, please let me know and then we can uh, go from there. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Alan Deluger. I'm the University Archivist here at Seton Hall University. And before I get started, I just want to thank my wonderful colleague, Jen O'Shea and the wonderful members of the University Weekend um, Planning Committee for allowing me to uh, talk to you today about family history and genealogy. <laughs> this will, won't be an all-encompassing um, presentation because there's so many facets of family history research that are out there. And for those of you who are not familiar with family history, this will hopefully be a, um, a good introduction to the uh, study of it and how to really have fun and have success with finding your ancestors along the way, especially in terms of the uh, Seton Hall connections that you might have. But I'm also doing some general and other specifics just to give you the full picture. So from there, we're going to go forward and um, I look forward to uh, talking to you in more detail because I love to hear the stories of your own experiences with family history research. Oh, and during the presentation, if you want to use the chat box, uh, feel free to do so. Ask me questions, please share your stories and so forth. I may not be able to get to it during the presentation, but I'll be happy to answer you afterward, but also actually after today as well. Happy to work with you on your own research efforts. Okay, without any further ado, I'll start um, in more detail. Okay, just an overview. A lot of people say family history and genealogy or intermingle the two. I just wanted to give you sort of a background on um, genealogy from the scientific standpoint about what it's really all about. Um, Genealogy, as you can see here, is the study of families, family history, and tracing of lineages. Basically, as, as you hear terms such as uh, roots, family trees, and so forth, it's going back in time. There's so many wonderful resources out there, even TV shows like uh, Henry Louis Gates's tremendous PBS series on finding your ancestors, Who Do You Think You Are, which is more fun in terms of celebrities and who their ancestors are and so forth. And genealogists use a whole number of different resources to come up with answers to the questions and trying to find that family tree and place in all the components and then build on that particular uh, chain of events. So it's really a wonderful um, exploration of who we are and who our uh, family members are. It's really a great history and a really great study. I know I'm a little bit biased, but at the same time, as I said, I love hearing stories about others and what's going on. Now, as you go forward in terms of family history, the pursuit of family history is shaped by motives of various kinds. Usually they're shaped out of a uh, interest of the individual. And then it can go into family as you discuss things with your parents, your brothers and sisters and others. And we go forward. And so basically storytelling and then having this particular information not only for present generations, but future generations to look at as well as invaluable unto itself. So not only are you doing something to help your own curiosity and satisfaction, but you're also helping those in the future to learn more about you know, different aspects of your own life and those who are close to you. So it's really a wonderful thing. And I mentioned here at the bottom, genealogy research is also performed for scholarly or forensic purposes. Jen and I were talking a little bit before the meeting or the session about um, all the DNA tests that are going on um, different companies you can trace where your ancestors came from from a scientific standpoint and also from a scholarly standpoint if you have something that works in terms of um, academics classroom teaching and so forth because i bring a lot of uh, family history options to my students and if they want to trace their own family trees it's all good so anyway that's the uh, long-winded version of genealogy and what it's all about and 
how it um, connects to basically the overall scientific and all practical usage of uh, finding your family ancestors. OK, information needs. It's very logical. Basically, the value of information in all its forms is great. Um, I say school assignments because, again, I was working on a, a class project, but this is um, the school of life, too. Basically, from your own perspective, what you want to learn, what your family and friends want to learn, and so forth. And then highlight your personal interest. Because one of the things that's really heartening and really wonderful to experience are hearing about what people are passionate about. And this is something that is great to be captured, too, for the um, your own memories, your own memory bank, but also for those who are close to you and others, just to share something about yourself. And it makes it just a wonderful interaction potential for down the road. And I should say the more you have, the better. It's kind of like a catch-22 in many ways. You're looking for information, you're going back in time, and sometimes as you go further back, it's a little bit scarcer to find materials. But the more you have to go on, the better. So it's the cases, the further back you go in terms of your family history search. So I point this out because sometimes you have to dig and really find different types of material. And also in terms of context, it's really important in terms of going forward. Um, and then just like capturing as much as you can at the uh, time you're going uh, into the research mode, so to speak. So what you learn, it's all the more interesting. And let's get into some more detail about how to proceed forward based on the information you need and the information you want to uh, accumulate in the future. So this is just an initial suggestion, and this works well with a lot of individuals I know who do genealogy and also just do research projects in general. Basically, your initial checklist, very basic. You know, your, uh, your five W's and your one H. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. So the who is who you're looking for. Again, common sense and logical and straightforward. What is the primary or secondary source materials? And let me explain some about primary and secondary, just in case you're not familiar. Primary is firsthand accounts. These are like letters, memoranda, ledgers, diaries, newspapers, and things that are written by the firsthand person. And most importantly, autobiographies, which the individual is putting themselves into the story and then putting it out there for, you know, basically evaluation from a um, wider audience along with themselves and what they put into the actual content. Secondary sources are based on biographies, um, secondhand accounts. So hence the name secondary. Um, things that have been written about individuals, internet sources, um, book sources, and so forth. So secondary is important unto itself because it does give usually a wonderful background on a particular subject area, person, place, or thing. Primary is the prime stuff as well. So all these type of source materials work together well in terms of finding as much information again as you can. And where I say here on off campus, um, connected to Seton Hall, of course, so you can do it anywhere, especially with the advent of the internet. This is probably one of the greatest um, boons to the genealogical craft or um, study that you can have, because there's so many things that you can do right in your own house to uh, move forward on the search. Now, when is any time you want, and that's the beauty again of having uh, resources to the internet and other electronic resources as well. Or you can schedule something, you know, on a uh, college campus, an archive, a history center, or what have you. Thought and visitation is how you go about it. You know, doing the preparation and then. Why? The promise of unique discovery, as I call it, because your family story is your family story and there's nothing else quite like it. And that's what makes it really important to pursue if you choose to go that route. So now you're ready to go and then move forward in terms of the specifics of doing your genealogical search. OK, some other initial factors. Now, I mentioned the more you have, the better in terms of information. So any information you can gather even if you don't think it's specific to um, say your grandfather, great grandfather, grandmother, great grandmother, for example, if you have contextual information, and I'm a big fan of context because say you have um, somebody who went to Seton Hall, and I'll get back into the Seton Hall things in a few moments in more detail, who went to Seton Hall, 
but maybe lived off campus in South Orange, and maybe he spent a little bit of time in Newark uh, living during their time on campus in a particular neighborhood, and maybe they, um, you know, visited a particular theater on their spare time or went to the local market or something. Those places have a history too, and they're part of the story of that individual. So that's just something that keeping in mind outside of the old um, army or military thing of name, rank, serial number. So just fleshing out your materials and then having any information is really a great idea. So when you go about your process, just keep that in mind as you go forward. And you have to remember where your ancestors came from. If you know that information, of course, you know, you know, in the present day, which is great, and you have your family members, you know where they're living. And maybe, you know, one or two generations back where they lived in the U.S. or if they came from abroad. It's all wonderful. And one of the things that is really important to note when you're looking for specifics, and this is one thing that's important, is that sometimes you know, name changes, new identity in terms of different factors that are involved, um, especially Ellis Island. If anybody's been there, tremendous place in terms of history, but also in terms of meaningful um, immigration stories galore. So it's a really great thing. Not just Ellis Island, but other places and other stories that have come into the U.S. from abroad that have made this country, but also the worldwide um, exploration of different family history so important. So that's just one thing to keep in mind as you go forward. There's other variables such as maybe uh, different names of places, townlands or you know, counties or other places they may have come from to keep in mind. And definitely talk to your family members. I should have bold faced this. Anybody who can put stories together, give you information is really important. And I know, and this is this is definitely not a knock or not a criticism, but I know some generations and some may have had different experiences, especially World War II veterans, um, those from other countries may not be so open in terms of sharing their stories, but as much as you can you know, get from them is very, uh, very key if you can do that or you know, other family members who might know and fill in the gaps and the blanks, so to speak. So and it's, a, and it's a really, again, it's a fun exercise in most cases and ways you can really interact with your family and do something that's really a wonderful group activity. Not for the sake of a group activity, but again, it has so many benefits to it in the short and long run of life. And please record everything. The beautiful part is in the past, it was mostly a case of before tape recorders, it was like basically writing down information. If you had a great memory, the wonderful gripes of Africa and um, um, story cap captures and historians of villages and so forth. Wonderful. Based on that tremendous tradition. Um, ways we can record nowadays, especially we're recording now through Teams. But any type of tape recorder, your phone, if it has a recording device and so forth, very important. Recording it and then transcribing it is really important. So you have both a original and a backup of what you've found. And again, information, 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 and it's preserved and you can share it. Okay, introductory notes. These are the most popular types of records in any type of family history going forward. Um, birth, immigration, if applicable, naturalization, if applicable, marriage, if applicable, and death. But I should have both faced birth and immigration, but um, I kind of like messed up there. But with that said, there are civil records and, of course, the life cycle of the individual. Birth and death are the automatics. Everything else is um, interesting. And also church records, regardless of the denomination, follow the same type of pattern, only their records are a little bit different. For example, in the Catholic Church, which I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, civil would be birth, um, church record would be baptism, the christening. Um, moving forward, it would be marriage, which is just like a civil, you know, a civil record. Um, if somebody goes into the clergy or the sisterhood or what have you, another type of, you know, midlife, um, you know, choice and experience that is recorded. And then, of course, unfortunately, the, um, the passing of somebody and death records. Um, and this just gives the nucleus of defining the basics of human activity, as I, as I put in the slide here. But along with these basics, I said fleshing it out. Yeah, there's always much more to explore along the way based on these particular aspects of family history and just recording, especially the life cycle in basic terms. So moving forward, there's so much more to explore. 
So on to more interesting ways to go about finding the information. Okay, and some of these, if you've done started your family history, if you're advanced, again, I, I'd love to hear your stories. And also I congratulate you and, and I'm in awe because those who really work with family history and um, do their genealogies in more detail, or really devoted to it are tremendous resources for helping others too. I find it's a tremendous community in that respect. And that's why if this is second nature, my apologies, but if it's a first go around, I'm happy to tell you some of the things that my contemporaries, but also um, my, myself and uh, others that I work with use. The internet, again, I, I use that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I talked about that briefly. Basically institutional and personal websites, it's a good way of sharing information and then also questions that come up as well, um, which fits actually more into listservs and email blasts to um, different groups, different individuals you might be working with. It's always good to have maybe even a friend who's doing their own genealogy so you can bounce ideas off of each other, um, along with family members as well. Brochures and flyers, not only from genealogical websites, seminars, different activities, just from town activities. I mentioned context. Again, say your uh, your uh, town or city is having a um, meeting of um, the council or something like that, and there's some important thing coming up, like a like a carnival, um, a um, donation day, or something like that. And if you have a flyer for it either paper form or electronic, regardless. This information could be um, invaluable in a later context when you're writing your story and how you want to develop it. So it's all part of the experience of the individual and going, going ahead in terms of their community and working together. Newsletters, same as brochures and flyers. This is even, even better in many ways because the newsletters have a lot more local and specialized content involved with it. So any newsletters, newsletters you can pick up are tremendous and they'll really help the story develop in an even more profound way. Books and booklets, um, traditional, bedrock of different research as well. Again, I mentioned autobiographies, biographies, but also stories of towns and different uh, genealogical pedigrees as well. There's a lot of books on genealogy already written that could be helpful, not only if it's on your own family surname, for example, but also maybe others who might have like trees that extend into your own family. So something to really keep in mind as you're looking through libraries and other catalogs to see what might be out there printed already. So it could help in terms of, you know, backing up your work or even just giving you another whole sense or another whole direction to go into. Traditional media, everything's around us in terms of you know documenting things, especially um, newsworthy um, items of, of various kinds, excuse me. Traditional media, newspapers, unfortunately newspapers are a little bit in trouble in terms of um, being printed in its, um, in its paper form, excuse the pun but in hardback form, but a lot of them are available on the internet along with other news sites, news feeds and so forth. So things of this nature are going through a renaissance, a different renovation since it's a different time in terms of social media and electronic resources which are taking over. But newspapers are especially invaluable today for local obituaries. That's the one thing that the genealogist benefits from for having newspapers still remain in business, along with headlines and other local news where available. Television rated the same thing, different type of medium. Newspapers are more preservation uh, friendly in many ways because you have the content, it's right there. But as television is doing um, in cable and various other internet sources are streaming like different video shows and, and the news and what have you on demand. You have things that they're archiving in a video case and radio too. Radio is a little bit more, many people say it's antiquated, but it's still a great source in terms of, you know, again, they save their own materials, webcast, um, and various things of that nature are key in terms of exploring this medium as well. So these are the top three in terms of traditional media, trying to piece together your story in various ways, especially if you find a relative and if yourself have been on television or on a radio show or featured in a newspaper, it's really great to save that uh, information again for your own uh, archive, but also for sharing for future generations to uh, enjoy as well. Social media, 
this is really important and this is really interesting. I can't keep up with all the new um, platforms or new um, things that are coming out. I think Snapchat is one of the more recent ones I don't have on here. And Skype might even be passe at this point. But Skype is a lot better in terms of, I think you can record on it. And that's a really good tool for doing especially family history interviews and so forth. Just like our teams uh, meeting here today, for example. Facebook is great. Twitter is, you know, it's limited in terms of wordage um, and pictures, but still, if you put together enough uh, content, you have some really great stuff there. Same with blogs too, you know, promoting what you're doing, but also sharing the results of your research as well. And there's, and there's others out there as well that you can explore as technology marches forward, or if you find other even, you know, uh, old fashioned or old school technology as well. I even work with 78 RPMs. I know it's a little bit tricky to, um, I don't think you have any recording <laughs> mechanisms for that anymore, but even things like um, if you have information on a floppy disk or some type of older hard drive and what have you, that's something to keep in mind too as a tool that if you can extract the information and put it into a newer format, you have something great that'll last forward for your to explore. And various other tools to use. Um, I just wanted to put this up here for some repetition, just to, just for reinforcement, and in various contexts. Academic, again, not only a classroom usage, but in terms of academic institutions and collecting in terms of their own um, specific institutional like memory, which is key. Different types of things that will be important in terms of what they offer. I'll talk more about the archive or primary source aspects in a moment, but in terms of even being affiliated with a college, university, high school, um, extension division, you know, local uh, community school or what have you, any type of school usually has a library. And then they subscribe to different databases, which are great in terms of finding information of various kinds, um, which is tremendous in terms of finding different things, which will be, um, important to use, but also it's something specific and it helps just to be honest, economically too. If you are part of that community, you have the, um, usually have the rights to access and then like, you know, avail yourself of these great resources, mostly secondary, but no less important or no less informational. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm talking on general terms, but just to give you sort of a sense of, you have different options if you're not familiar with them. And libraries, of course, your public library, a good friend to everybody in terms of accessing it. I know at this time of COVID, it's a little bit more tricky to um, go in person, but a lot of the libraries that I know of are trying to be more sympathetic and more, you know, adaptive to this uh, climate where we're all off site and so forth. Same with colleges and schools as well. So don't hurt. Don't hesitate. It doesn't hurt to go out to reach out to the website of your local library, contact them if there's nothing on their homepage to see what their hours are, if you can come in or things that you can borrow from outside, or even if they have electronic resources you can use right from their site. So something to explore if you want to go that route. Family teachers, information professionals, again, you know, avail yourself of them. Most are so friendly and very accommodating in terms of sharing their own information. Books, newspapers, magazines, journals, again, you know, these are very key in terms of background information, but also some type of information that will be helpful to you um, with the hopes that, you know, the more the better. Again, I'll be, uh, I'll be reiterating those words, the more information, the better. And then archival materials, as I say more in a moment, manuscripts, photographs, there's so many different types of formats out there, and I'll explore some of those in a moment. Electronic resources. Now I'll go into a little bit more specific here. There's a lot of great sources out there. I have a few on my uh, next to last slide here, you know, starting uh, sites for genealogy, but you just want to be careful about free sites versus subscription sites. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. I think most of you maybe have heard of Ancestry, Family Tree, or um, 23andMe and so forth. These are wonderful sites, but they're subscription based. There's some free ones that'll help you get into a, a rhythm or a starting point as well. So just something to keep in mind as you're going uh, forward in terms of looking and how far and how what level you want to go to. I, I use Ancestry myself. I'm not a commercial message. I just want to say it is helpful for some things and um, they do keep adding to it. 
and other sites as well to um, in terms of subscription and then like basing the records in terms of what they can um, accumulate and go forward. So with that said, whatever level you want to go on to, it's tremendous. And then you can, you know, put on your own specific parameters because genealogy is an individual um, science in many ways, even though you do have to use all these materials to go forward. It is something about you and what it means to you and how you want to um, adapt it and how you want to uh, shape it to what you want it to ultimately be. So with that said, electronic resources are great. Reference, citing your work is, is key, not only just to give credit to the authors or those who uh, create the information, but also it helps in terms of if you want to go back and use information um, at a later date. That way you have a, a focal point to um, refer to, and then you can just go back in time and, uh, and, and the resources that you might need. So all this looks together, more tools you can use on your path to uh, more information ahead. Okay, external and contemporary. Now there's a lot of different types of records out there. I, I mentioned the uh, the life chain, you know, birth to uh, death a few slides ago, and the other alt options that are, you know, most popular, basically immigration, naturalization, marriage, and so forth. These are the types of records that are really um, the most popular, and my apologies for not putting all of them on here, again, for the sake of space and also time. Uh, civil, military, church, immigration, political, census, uh, geographical records as well. Um, we'll have this slide, these slides available, or I can answer any questions at a later date too. Again, uh, happy to do so. But this just gives you sort of a sense of like some of the um, major areas that individuals explore from. And there's a lot of uh, cross currents too. A lot of people look at, you know, if they're really serious about each one of these type of records and even more. But in most cases, the starting genealogist or the one who's just looking for you know, some you know, basic information, usually it's civil. And if they had a relative in the service, that's another one that's really um, popular. And then church records and immigration, these top four seem to be the most popular. Census and statistical, you know, come in there as well, especially now that we're in a census year and um, they're looking at records and uh, coming up with the latest um, tally of individuals, neighbors neighborhoods and so forth, which is key. Even going back in time, census records, and they're released every, I think, 70 years or so to the public um, in various forms. Um, very helpful in terms of maybe even finding a relative or so forth. So all of these tied together really help the uh, genealogist, family historian, come and get, get as much information as possible, not only the basics, but also expanding upon that in various ways. So. I'll say it here again, context and fleshing out your specifics are really great, no matter what type of uh, records you're using or whatever type of um, area you're looking at, regardless. OK, maybe you've seen this at some point, the family tree. Now, usually this helps in terms of a schematic. Printing your information is great if you have a ledger, however you want to do it. Excellent, as long as you record the information and as much information. The family tree will help you give you a visual look or a diagram at how you um, explore your family tree. And I've seen individuals do, you know, all sides of their family, you know, basically say your father's side, uh, your mother's side, which usually comes from another, you know, they have a maiden name or if they keep their name, whatever, it's all good. Um, and then they have their own chart and then maybe the other side of the family. A family tree can go on forever. That's why they call it a tree, because you have your roots. You're the, you're at the uh, prime center at, of the rootage. You're the tree. And then from there, the branches, however it you know has come about, goes from there. So that's why it's a really apt analogy and a really great one, because, excuse me, um, because all this connects together in some way or some fashion. How many people have played the Kevin Bacon game, Six Degrees of Separation? I think in this in this life, there's a lot of people who have cousins or other family members who may not be evident at first in terms of your family. But as you explore more and your family tree grows out, you can go in different directions. So that's part of the fun and part of the exploration that drives a lot of genealogists to move forward on their research. So as you start out, something to keep in mind, something to uh, aspire to if you want to go that route and to that extent as well. All right, let's get into educational records. Okay, Seton Hall, 
very important. But I'm also going to touch upon like um, grade school, um, high school, preparatory school, and so forth, along with college records. These are ones that are sometimes overlooked in many ways, and I call them academic or alumni records because I've had individuals come into uh, our archive and look for family pictures in yearbooks, which are, re it's really a heartening experience because a student who might have had a parent or parents or even grandparents or great grandparents attend Seton Hall, they always want to look at the yearbook and what they look like back in the day, especially during the 70s, really interesting in terms of the fashions hairstyles and everything. But I think that's tremendous as well because that really gives a reflection on the time and the context of you know how students were at that particular time and place. And as part of the Scene Hall family, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a good thing too. So I'm a bit biased, but I say it's it's wonderful. Even not uh, Seton Hall graduates, but whatever school you uh, may have attended and if you have that school spirit or that nostalgia or your love for your alma mater, it's all like positive and it's a good way to not only rekindle your memory or your imagination but also in terms of finding tangible proof of you know how you attended and also sharing it with your um, your children and others who might be interested okay i call this grade point averages basically determining the schools attended um, and learning about maybe the curriculum of the school teachers subjects and so forth especially if it was a parochial school or a private school that had a per particular curriculum. Uh, this is part of a contextual thing, but it's something that might be key. Sometimes, and we don't, this is something we don't work with. We don't work with grades themselves because that's that's confidential information. That's, that's among families and individuals to determine and work with um, within themselves. But for anything else that's public information, we we're happy to help in terms of like uh, class descriptions, maybe who is the list of roster of faculty who are there for a particular year, the subjects that were taught in a particular subject area, reading list and so forth, syllabi and what have you. And along with that, you know, in terms of um, moving down, I mentioned again, parochial prep schools, colleges, universities, and everything that's involved. Now, Seton Hall itself, you know, has the uh, Catholic tradition, the Catholic uh, College of New Jersey first until 1950 when I became the Catholic University of New Jersey and very popular not only here in the region but across the country and we have uh, global alumni as well over 10,000 so that's a lot of um, uh, genealogical firepower right there in terms of who we have and who might potentially be interested in their Seton Hall experience and I mentioned not only the Catholic Church but we have this tremendous Judeo-Christian Studies Institute We've had individuals from different religious traditions, which is tremendous. And that gives sort of like a luster, a really great uh, history in terms of our diversity here on campus. So these are things that we uh, always keep in mind in terms of maybe clubs, activities, um, different you know, ministries and so forth. So all this ties together in terms of sort of like the one layer of context, which goes into a student's experience educationally on our campus in particular. And the types of records, again, some overlap, but also some specifics, um, type of school, type of institution, and maybe where it came from. Now, I mentioned college, university, two-year, four-year, and so forth. Um, community colleges, too. And I'm really big on community colleges, not just because I, I graduated from one, but also because a lot of them are building archives of their own, um, which they haven't done before. And this is something that's really key, especially in terms of the education because we've also had a lot of transfers to Seton Hall from two-year schools so it you know perpetuates their story in terms of the educational trajectory of their own lives and even like graduate school as well you know whatever their uh, master's thesis or doctoral dissertation is that's something that they wrote that's something that you know can be celebrated and something that goes into the family story about how they may be a trailblazer maybe something really dynamic or original in terms of their research and then going from there and in terms of maybe the type of school as well, you know, public schools, um, New Jersey that we're connected with, we have materials that connect to New Jersey and how they um, sponsored and supported us through different educational periods in our history. And also that's a contextual thing in terms of maybe you're there in 1897, well, not you, but um, you're a family member. When we switched from the prep to the college division and the state was very enthusiastic and this connects into curriculum, you know, 
the prep and the college were still in the same place, but just a different level of um, support and um, chartering and paperwork, so to speak. So from there, you go forward in terms of the type and then types of student records. I have the more illustrative types here, but I'll get into more specific text in a moment. Those of you who were students or who are students now, you'll see the Suetonian is an electronic form presently, but it has a proud tradition going back to 1924. And a lot of this information is really great in terms of um, the student run newspaper and how it really talked about different student activities focused on individuals over the years as this, as the newspaper developed and its format changed as we had student editors who changed quite a bit. But the same frameworks in place in terms of information and having it timely to that particular period when it was written. But the surviving information is key in terms of building into the context and what, what is available at that time period from contemporary and present day eyes. Register books, you know, when somebody was registered, especially in the 19th century, information about the individual, where they came from, parent, parent names. Um, yearbooks, probably the bedrock of any type of uh, family history research. You know, you get the um, graduates, but even those who are in lower classes, lower in the sense that, you know, they weren't up to the senior level yet. Um, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen were typically in early yearbooks, you know, focused as well, their picture, their name, and maybe, if we're lucky, some activities. But the senior portraits, in many of the cases, especially from the 19th through, I'd say, the 1950s, usually they were very positive, even if um, the individual may not have been you know, very talkative or was shy or some other reason. Um, they always had a nice quote or nice background along with their activities, their nicknames, the name and various pictures. This one's great because it has a baby picture, senior picture and a picture during um, his um, time at Seton Hall. We don't always have that, but the more you can find the better. And of course, student activities, great pictures like this. The old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. Say your ancestor was in the band, they maybe played the drum like this one here that may have carried over or maybe they stopped playing the drum after college but you never knew they played the drum and that's something that can be explored as well so all these different questions and answers that can be um, had and uh, hopefully um, <laughs> the answers found within our archives and other ones as well so i say shared experiences because again family history is something that's personal but it's also meant to be shared, the life experience, you know, the human activity, which is what we celebrate here in the archives. Um, different people I've talked to, especially alumni, remember a concert, a sporting event, go Pirates, and I know basketball season's coming up, but all of our other great sports as well, the fall, winter, and spring, but also concerts, uh, public um, lectures, and other types of things have been memorable to a number of uh, Seton Hall. Uh, alumni and individuals over the years. Most of our concerts and famous individuals have been the campus, especially during the 1950s through roughly the early 80s. Not to say that ones who have come after are no less important or famous, but some of the ones who we're, we're more familiar with, especially in pop culture, as well as in pop culture, um, have been here. Of course, we had the boss here for uh, two visits in the mid 70s. And I always laugh because the uh, price is in Wash Gym in 1974 for a seat to see him was four dollars and fifty cents. Part of the context, and it's very key. Of course, he didn't get all the hits that he's had since, but still at the same time, that's a bargain. And hope he comes back at some point. But you have that story if you saw the boss here at Seton Hall in Wash Gymnasium. The Four Seasons were here, Frankie Valley at the height of their fame too. Um, back in the late 60s. Billy Joel was here, Bob Hope, famous individual of um, uh, another generation, but still very much esteemed and very um, key in terms of, you know, his visits to military bases and his touring, his comedy and so forth. Hey, we wouldn't have Thanks for the Memories, which is a great theme song for archival research and, uh, and genealogy without him. Fleetwood Mac, who were just talking, I just saw Sunday morning, Stevie Nicks has this viral video going going out there. And somehow you can maybe tie that in. Oh, Stevie Nicks, part of Fleetwood Mac. She played Seton Hall back in, say, 75, and so forth. Of course, Ray Charles, Dionne Warwick, and many others. So these are things, not only musical groups and so forth, I'll talk about a few others in a moment, but 
this gives you a sense of things that can really go into uh, fleshing out, but also heightening and really exciting your family uh, history story. And here's in more detail, the uh, tracing your own Setonia roots. I have that uh, image again, which is great. Um, catalogs, handbooks, newspapers, yearbooks, attendance registers, um, 19th century especially, syllabi, student organization, scrapbooks. Scrapbooks are great. Um, one thing, if you're doing a scrapbook yourself, you might want to, um, there's a lot of places on the internet where you can see how you can do it, which is um, preservation friendly. We have quite a few scrapbooks where people have glued um, things into them, um, which, you know, we appreciate the effort, but at the same time, it's kind of tricky when the glue um, gets funky but also the other side of the, well, it's a whole thing, but suffice to say, if you can do a preservation fam, uh, friendly scrapbook, this is a really key thing and very helpful in terms of another layer, another aspect of uh, preserving your family history and programs from those shared events and various notebooks or writings that you want to share, especially your class notes and so forth. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Other things that you can work on in terms of tracing the academic trajectory of your life and others. And just a brief screenshot of our archives and special page, uh, library.shu.edu slash archives. You can search for collections right here on our box. We may not have everything in our collection listed right now. It's at the red, but if you inquire to us through archives at shu.edu, or um, if you you know, use my email, I'm happy to reach out to you at the end of the program. My email address is there as well, so we can go from there. But that's our home page if you want to access it at any point. Now, this will go a little bit quickly. I'm going to go down the uh, I just put this in here just for your own um, information. Going back a few slides in terms of affiliations. Um, same for uh, Protestant denominations, Judaic, uh, Islam and other types of um, religious sects. But I just wanted to focus on Catholic family research because it's so intertwined in terms of Seton Hall because we're one of the very few dioceses or archdiocese in the country, one of three that has our archdiocesan records on an academic uh, archive. And that's here at Seton Hall, the Archdiocese of Newark. But we also do a lot with Catholic New Jersey and so forth. And we have various family history resources here. So that's why I just wanted to put this in and I'll go through this again fairly quickly because we're down to our last uh, 15 minutes, I believe. Okay. I say the three R's, registers, rights, and rights, and requests in terms of finding information, having access to them, and then facilitating them well. One thing that's key to learn, we don't have every church record within the Archdiocese of Newark. And I should point out the Archdiocese has split over time really quickly. 1853 is when we were founded, the Diocese of Newark. 1881, it split North Jersey, South Jersey. The Diocese of Trenton was formed in that year for those in, you know, below New Brunswick, I believe. Those above New Brunswick, Diocese of Newark. The next one came in 1937 when the uh, Diocese of Newark was split and made it the Archdiocese. Um, and the Diocese of Patterson came into being, which is more west, north, northwest New Jersey for most of it. And then extreme south was the Diocese of Camden that came to existence. So we became an Archdiocese in 1937. And the only other split came in 1981 when the Diocese of Metuchen was carved out of um, Patterson and part of Newark. So the four counties of um, northeastern uh, New Jersey comprise the uh, Archdiocese of Newark at the present time. With that said, various church records before those times and even after those times, up until like a diocese was formed, we might have those records, but we're happy to guide you to another direction if we don't have them. And I should point out that functioning parishes or churches usually hold on to their own records until they um, are either merged or um, or closed. So with that um, you know, disclaimer, I'm just going to move forward here. Now, in terms of, again, the life cycle, baptism and in the church, you have the first communion. Um, penance really or reconcile confession doesn't really have any documentation because that's a personal thing between the um, the penitent and the priest anyway confirmation marriage holy orders if there's a priest or deacon and then sisters records and then anointing of sick, sick which is last rites and death records or uh, cemetery records are the, uh, the last part of this just real quickly, baptismal record, and I'll go through these again quickly, but you have in the PowerPoint, if you want to check them later, um, individual, sponsors, year, 
range and so forth. It, it, it mirrors the uh, birth record in many ways and very, uh, very good, good ways to just to give you sort of like the, uh, the spiritual aspect about how things are moving forward in terms of the christening of the individual. And here's one example, one of our earliest ones actually from 1832, uh, St. John's Newark. So it's a little bit, we're outside the time range and to, if you can read, I say anybody who can read 19th century script, I mean, that's, I would consider that a second language in many ways. It's so beautiful, so ornate, but sometimes deciphering is a little bit tricky. So those of you can do it, it's like kudos. That's a skill that's really, uh, really important just to decipher and bring more information to light. Marriage record, same thing. The individuals to be married, the sponsors, the priest, the clergy who was the officiant, um, various other information about where they lived and so forth. Um, and also, and speaking of language, not only uh, 19th century script, but Latin, especially the vernacular of the church. Um, Latin, and then sometimes in terms of the vernacular of the individual or the uh, family, which might be German or French or Spanish or Irish or what have you. All these things you have to be keeping in mind. And then maybe if you know the language, have a translator or work on the translation yourself. These could be found in various types of church records um, as you move forward. And here's a sacramental register for marriage, another early one from the 1830s. And I should point out that different registers change over time. There's not just one set register. So different companies publish their own. So keep in mind that some information on one might not reflect some on another between parishes or other marriages if they cut off the book from one year to another. So these are things just to keep in mind. There's a lot to keep in mind when you're doing that genealogy, but it all connects together because it helps your thought pattern too in terms of going in different directions, but keeping an orderly line, sort of like the tree, the tree of um, thought and research. You have your tree, okay, do I need this record? What's involved? Okay, is there another record? It's kind of like a perpetual, it's like the uh, domino effect. There's always something more behind the next domino, so to speak. Holy order, if you're the priest um, who's gonna enter the, um, the clergy, same types of things, but only in terms of um, maybe where they're celebrating their first mass, um, their ordination and so forth. And this is example of um, priest records, you know, sermon notes and so forth. We've had a lot of individuals, aunts and uncles who belong to the religious life, who maybe did um, sermons or mentioned in parish bulletins and what have you, that might have an example that works for family history researchers. And the death record, unfortunately, again, the the, um, the death of the individual, their basic information, priest, and so forth. And this is an example of a death record and also a different type of register, as you can see here. The 1830s ones were a little bit more interesting, and this one, a little bit 1944, um, and so forth. So that gives you sort of like a background on what's going on. And a lot of, rec a lot of questions we get are about the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, and there's a theological you know, connection between this. In short, basically, um, LDS, what they do is retrospective, retroactively, I'm sorry, uh, baptize individuals who have their records digitized or recorded through their service. It's free of charge. But at the same time, it's something that's a, um, it's a theological sticking point. And the Catholic Church doesn't endorse this. So I'm just being realistic. I'm just telling you what the, um, what the edicts are. But the one thing in 1976, we do have LDS uh, microfilm from the time when uh, Archbishop Garrity was our leader of the Archdiocese of Newark. His only question was how much did it cost? And the answer was free. So they, they allowed him to do it. So our microfilm is very popular and it is used on a regular basis, but it only goes from the 19th century up to about roughly 1930 in most cases. So this just gives you a sense of some of the things that we work with in different areas. Oh, and I should put out the LDS sponsors, Ancestry, Family Tree, and a lot of these subscription services too, to recoup their, uh, <laughs> their, their finances and so forth, but also allow and offer records to individuals who are subscribed to the service and who can connect to that particular uh, area. Okay, Catholic New Jersey, again, an offshoot. It does connect to Seton Hall, in a roundabout way, but at the same time, parish life is key. We do have a parish on campus, parish bulletins, that shared uh, spiritual experience. This is a wonderful picture of Christ the King in Jersey City at the time, and it 
again, the picture says, you know, tells a thousand, it's like a thousand words, tells a lot of stories. A lot of uh, parishes in uh, Catholic New Jersey, but around the country had their own bands or own organizations. And you can see the priests in the top hats and all that. They were probably being set for a Holy Name Day parade, which was very common back in the uh, mid 20th century. And after World War II, a lot of this, you know, went away due to uh, shortages in people and different ways that things went forward, and especially Vatican II. Keeping in, in mind not only the context of the geography or the school, but also in terms of what was going on around the state, the country, the, uh, the world at that time period. So just for example, again, World War II, you know, Seen Hall was operating. It was on a limited basis. A lot of the students there went off to the military, came back on the GI Bill that paid for their uh, education. We had the largest influx of individuals in the nation come in 1946 after the war, 95% uptick in um, enrollment. And I wouldn't want to be a registrar at that time, but <laughs> those who did it, kudos to them. And that's something that added to our alumni base and it really helped us in terms of moving forward. But not only that, the stories they brought back from different theaters of operation, the Pacific, Europe, or where ha have you. So again, you know, geographical context, not only here locally, but throughout the world. And church involvement, we'll go through this a little bit more quickly. Um, different things that resources, you know, again, primary source documentation, weekly bulletins, census, church productions, a lot of the theatricals and the programs from those theatrical programs. Parish histories are great, mostly secondary, but you know, usually every, well, it's usually on the tens or the fives when the anniversary is celebrated. Um, and then we have a lot of great parish histories, but also not only here, but other types of archives work with, especially religious-based ones, parish histories and things of that nature. Institutions and societies, you know, being again that triangle between Catholic New Jersey, Seton Hall, Archdiocese of Newark, and so forth. Again, we have a seminary too, which which works together in terms of that story. And the priest who may have been educated at Seton Hall maybe went to the seminary and who work as a priest in the archdiocese or work for the archdiocese. So hospital, orphanage, holy name, other types of societies. A lot of them go around on the ethnic lines as well. The AOH is the Irish, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, Unico. United in our Irish, uh, I'm sorry, United in our Italian um, collaboration. Um, very Italian, very excellent organization as well. Knights of Columbus, you know, one of the most famous and one of the most active things in terms of promoting the Catholic Church. Various Catholic charities. Mercier Club, you know, Cardinal Mercier from World War One. It's a social but also an intellectual club. So from the obscure, like the Mercier to the Knights of Columbus and everything else, these are records and institutions that may have been um, either visited or have relatives who work there. So things to keep in mind as you're looking at different types of, you know, maybe off the beaten path records. Life events and legacies, again, I mentioned um, previously, you know, different types of concerts and things at Seton Hall. And that Four Seasons poster is so good, I used it again. But <laughs> anyway, movies sporting events, holidays, stories, and so forth, you know, movies, you know, going my way, I was talking to somebody the other day, really great movie, Academy Award winner from 1944, Bing Crosby, you know, maybe, um, say, for example, you know, your grandparents maybe got together and met, and their first song they listened to was a Bing Crosby song, you know, back in the 40s, just for example, great memory, it's a great story, it goes into a wonderful place, and the, uh, genealogy or the family history being created. Basketball games, memorable ones. Of course, last year, how about the team? National champions, but I, I know that's an unofficial poll, but I think we'd have a lot of support for that particular, um, you know, rating. Um, other games have been just as memorable um, and so forth. Not just basketball, football, baseball, and so forth. So all these things tie together in terms of the, the collected and shared memory, which is so important in terms of like, not only history and just on the paper, but also in terms of like liveliness and passion and just something to share and um, and show in terms of allegiance, but also in terms of just something that brought joy. And then newspapers, I mentioned newsletters, newspapers, so forth, and they go in various ways. Social, social justice, 
pretty extreme Republican right wing base in the 1940s, Father Coughlin. Um, but we also have the counterpoint, Dorothy Day and the um, Catholic Worker. This is the first editorial um, illustration in the Catholic Advocate of Newark in 1951. So they were starting something that set a trend for other dioceses and other news outlets too, um, in terms of what was happening within a particular parish through the diocese. And there's a lot of you know, connection on different names and individuals who contributed to different institutions, like a few slides back in terms of especially organizations they belong to and different events they sponsored. And here's our uh, commission newsletter, New Jersey Catholic Historical Commission, helpful and working with the uh, Seton Hall archives and all Catholic outlets throughout the state in terms of uh, research and um, fostering publication and different types of genealogical aspects. Um, and and projects that are going on throughout the state, but also through other areas that have some connection to the Garden State and to Catholicism, but also in terms of religious studies too. We're non-sectarian. We like to help anybody who um, who asks for help, and uh, as part of a collaboration, that's the way I look at any type of research project. Okay, last thing: photographs, diaries, formats, scrapbooks. A lot of Bibles have passages about families, and things over time that they recorded, especially on the front pages of a Bible, family Bible. And even the artifact alone is invaluable, but the information is a bonus. Ethologies, artifacts too. You know, things that you may have collected that tie into the three-dimensional story of your family history are key as well. Say you have that, um, you know, the tooth fairy came, you have that, that tooth of your uh, child or like a relative, for example, first lock of hair, first, um, yeah, your first shoes, you know, bronze them. I don't know if they do that anymore and so, and so forth and so on. Things of that nature all come together in terms of the logical and larger picture of family history. Additional tools, again, this is just for reinforcement. Yeah, I'm always I'm always reinforcing myself too. The things I haven't mentioned are encyclopedias, almanacs, the sori. Um, these are important because you can get general information on different contextual things through these resources. And they're just a big help if you want to just get snapshots of information to start you on the way. And the same again, oral history, video, manuscripts, and what have you. It's all, all these wonderful resources are out there waiting for you to explore if you choose to do so. Specific library tools here at Seton Hall, we can help you in terms of access, um, especially if you're students, um, working with your, um, you know, your children who are here on campus, administrators, faculty, and so forth. These are some of the great history ones we have, just an example. Um, and again, these give background, more substantial, secondary, but we're happy to work with you and uh, you know, suggest some things that might be helpful specific to your unique project. And just a few ma major Catholic archival links. These are things that are from other repositories. And again, I'll have this in the um, PowerPoint for later reference. Local libraries. I'll go with, um, you know, again, our different um, sister and brother colleges, Caldwell, College of St. Elizabeth, Felicia, St. Peter's, and Georgian Court, on that Catholic New Jersey connection. Lots of archivists I work with, lots of librarians, again, like genealogists, are very collaborative, very friendly, very welcoming in terms of sharing information. That's what it's all about, helping each other out wherever we can. And uh, other ones, you know, we, we don't play favorites. Drew, Princeton Theological, Princeton... The Reformed Church Archives has a great collection, United Methodist, my good friend Dale Patterson and Rutgers, and even um, ones locally outside of those ones that I've listed already. Okay, now again, just for your reference, these are just a few. These websites feature multiple uh, sites, Family Tree, American Ancestors, New Jersey Resources, and again, just be wary of what might be subscription versus free. If you want to go the subscription route, totally optional, free, helps you uh, get the ball rolling and gets your mind and gear in terms of what you might want to do, how you want to do it, and how expansive you want to make it. And that's me. Um, I really appreciate everybody's attention. Um, tremendous uh, audience, I really appreciate you uh, sticking out with me. And it's been a real joy to be with you. So I'm going to close the screen. I think we're right at the um, 230 mark. I'll go back here into the presentation. And what I said is I can um, spend a few minutes offline, but also in the chat if you have any questions, or you can maybe follow up with myself or Jen um, and go from there in terms of any uh, questions or thoughts you have. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day.
Thank you, Alan. It looks like somebody in the chat just wanted you to show the previous slide. OK, great. Thank you. Um, let me do this. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm technologically challenged, so let's just bring this up. And here's the last slide. Uh, great, thank you. Oh, my name's too big there, so but but I'm happy to um, you know, reach out. Please feel free to do, do so. <clears throat> and then somebody in the chat just asked if you'll be sending the slides and presentation. Yes, I can. I can do that. Um, I think you have the emails of all the participants, Jen. I don't. I don't want to give it to you if you don't want it. But at the same time, I'm happy to send it or put it in a place where you can reference it. It's like it's basically not in your face, but it's there if you need it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we can figure it out, you know, in a few moments. But yeah, here's my contact information. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your interest. <laughs>